Birmingham had a history of bombing. Bombing started in 1948. The first bomb exploded because someone either accidentally or intentionally sold a house to a person of color that crossed the imaginary dividing line. The imaginary dividing line had whites on one side of it and blacks on the other side. And the Klan came out and said, either you move them or we'll move them. And so this was the beginning of bombings in Birmingham. Birmingham was segregated by custom and by law, but many times acts of intimidation were, were used before they actually came out. Very rarely we saw anyone arrested for fraternizing. There was no socializing, but the, the bombing of the house was a way to intimidate. We also had isolated incidences of people getting beat up, just happened to be somewhere at night by themselves, a uh, different part of town, and they would be approached by uh, perhaps a group of people in a car, and they would be pulled out of the car and beat up. So either bombings or beatings and things were used to control people. Now, I think my parents joined this church because my grandfather was a Baptist preacher down in Clanton, Alabama, but I can tell you that it was a wonderful place to be when I was growing up. We had all kinds of programs here for children, and we did everything here. If there was an Easter egg hunt, if there was an overnight party, um, we were given uh, quite a bit of liberty in terms of planning things with uh, the programs and so forth. Uh, children were very active in this church. And so I like to say that to people that this is where we learn to do a lot of things. We learn to, uh, to speak, to grow, to uh, interact with people. But we, it was just a wonderful place to be, the activities that they had. Uh, they would send children during the summer on the National Baptist Conventions and things. And you know, it, it's not something that the majority of the young children in Birmingham had a chance to do. But this church had its own special history and its own special place during that time. say to everyone that bombing was a way of life in Birmingham. Um, on any given day we could just be sitting outside uh, outside on a porch on the curb or somewhere and we would hear that sound. It always felt like the earth shook. It's like boom, way out there somewhere. But then it would feel like the earth moved or it shook. And so uh, anytime that we heard that sound we knew that within a few minutes the phone would ring and someone would call and they would say they just bombed the A.G. Gaston Motel or they just bombed the home of Arthur Shores and you would get another call but you were hoping that always hoping that that call would say no one was hurt and we never got a call that anyone was hurt until we got this call. On that Sunday morning when we arrived at church uh, September 15th 1963 when I came in at 930 with two younger brothers Alan who was six and Wendell who was 10 and my job remember I was a secretary so I put them in a class, pass out these little reports, and my job was to count the money, take the attendance, tell what the summary was, Sunday school summary, all that stuff, and then we would reconvene about 10.30 and I would read that report. So this day I did it as I'd always done it, but when I came in that morning, uh, the church clerk, Mabel Shorter, she was an older lady, uh, was complaining about phone calls. Now the church had been getting phone calls all along, but they never shared that with children. There are a lot of things that we didn't know because they didn't tell us, but she told me that morning and I just kind of, uh, yeah, right. Just thought she was kind of overreacting to some things, you know, I didn't pay too much attention. When I came back, but you had to pass the bathroom where the girls were to get upstairs. Today you can't see that space. Uh, knowing that the first person convicted and taken to justice took 14 years to do it for the first person. And we didn't think anybody would ever be brought, so that room was sealed off. It's a closed space, it's not a space you can enter ever again. But at that time, you, if you went upstairs, you, the door was right there. And uh, when I got to the door, uh, the girls were there, the four girls were there. We were excited about two things that Sunday. It was youth day, which meant we were in charge of everything. We loved being in charge and of the worship service and everything. The second thing was a club meeting we were having. But I spoke to them and rushed past because I knew I had to get upstairs, get that report ready. I saw everybody. There were actually five girls in the bathroom. Didn't see the fifth one, Sarah. She was in the back, she survived. We think she survived because of the part of the bathroom that she was in. She's actually in one of the stalls 
If you, if you walked into the bathroom, it was a big lounge area with a freestanding mirror and sofa and chair, and then you went through another door and there were toilets, and the toilets were those big steel doors back then with the glass plate on the black back. And so uh, I didn't see her at all, but I spoke to them and then just made my way upstairs. Um, our lesson for that day was a love that forgives. And it comes from the text of Luke 23, Father forgive them but they know not what they do. So we had an opportunity to study that lesson um, for Sunday school, but uh, we did not know that we would not ever get to hear the pastor's message. When I left the girls and started upstairs, got to that office where Ms. Shorter had been, she wasn't there anymore, but the phone was ringing. I answered the phone, still holding all that material, and the male caller on the other end said, three minutes. And as quickly as they said that, they hung up. And I, when they hung up, I hung up the phone, but I'm still holding all these materials. And I stepped out into the sanctuary, and only because media is always here, anybody you can think of is always there, CNN, everybody. They come in and they want to count the steps. They'll say, show us where you were, and they count the steps. So we know it was just 15 steps answering the phone, walking out into the sanctuary when the bomb exploded. If you were in the church, that very first aisle, the first row, is where I was walking. I got to the first aisle when that side of the building, if you've been over there, you know the side that the bomb exploded, came crashing in. Everything came crashing in on that side. And of course, um, we didn't have carpeting then. We had hardwood floors. And you could hear people scream, and then you could hear the sound of feet, of shoes against the hardwood floor. People right out and that's when I got up off the floor and started running out with everybody else but looking for those two brothers the six-year-old and the ten-year-old and um, when we got outside the church was already surrounded by cops we learned later much much later years later that everybody knew that the bombs had been planted and in the court testimony what we heard was that the bomb didn't go off when it was supposed to 1022 is kind of an odd hour but what they said was they had it was a homemade bomb and the intent was that it would have gone off about maybe four or five six in the morning before the church people actually got there but for whatever reason it didn't we know the time because the clock stopped on that Sunday when I got home, I wouldn't learn until about 4 o'clock that day that the girls never made it out of the bathroom. And I thought about it and I thought about it, but I couldn't make myself go to the funeral. When we went to school on Monday morning, there was nothing said about the girls. No moment of prayer, no special address or anything, no assembly. And there was nothing done at the church, even when we re-entered this church. And there's nothing in the church that's named after the girls. So um, when you were in the park, if you noticed, you saw sculptures of the girls at the entrance. In 2013, when we reflected on the 50-year anniversary of the bombing, I started another 501c3, which was called Four Spirits, and it was organized specifically for the purpose of raising money for those sculptures. And we raised $400,000 for those. Elizabeth McQueen, a uh, white lady from Mountain Brook, did the sculptures. The sculpture out there represents the last two minutes in the bathroom before the girls died. We know those last two minutes only because Sarah, the girl that didn't die, said the last thing she heard was the 11-year-old Denise saying, Addie, please tie the sash on the back of my dress. So Addie steps up on the chair to tie the sash and the bomb explodes. Um, what you also saw with the sculpture was six doves. Four of those doves represent the girls that were killed. But you remember later that evening, we had two young men that were killed, Virgil Ware and Johnny Robertson. Cynthia Wesley's father was my grade school principal, grades one through eight. Chris McNair, Denise's father, was my ninth grade teacher. He was also the only black photographer that we had, and his work uh, easily uh, could be placed alongside the side of that of Spider Martin and Charles Moore or any of those people, but his work was not accepted for only one reason, and he was our only photographer in town for that same reason. And so uh, Carol Robertson, her mother was our local librarian in the black library, we had one, and then uh, Addie's sister, Junie, was in my Sunday school class. Well, fast forward, um, my, my parents decided that I would go to Fisk University, you know, sort of muddled through the rest of the year, the school, next two years, and then went, to, never talked to anybody, 
you know, other than the FBI that came to the house and, and wrote the transcripts and things. But we, we didn't talk in the house. No one ever asked me, are you okay? Are you afraid? Do you miss your friends? We just didn't talk, we didn't say a word. And so when I went off to college, um, I didn't say anything at college either. Didn't talk about it. And uh, But I, I did a lot of writing while I was there. I have a box of poetry I wrote just during the time I was at Fisk University. It's very dark, talks a lot about death and uh, wondering why I was here and the girls weren't, you know. Uh, in fact, when I read it today, I don't rarely take it out because it's, it's depressing to me now. But when I graduated, during the time I was at Fisk University, there came kind of a type of depression that, that settled on me. And it it stayed there for almost 20 years. Uh, my roommate had been through some very difficult things, so we weren't, we loved each other, but we probably should have been roommates with someone else because she would sort of uh, doctor on me and I would sort of doctor, we didn't talk about what we had been through, but we didn't really talk about it. We didn't really know why we were depressed. Back then, we didn't know so much about depression. People just thought you were strange, you know, and uh, they just thought you were different. And so this went on for 20 years, but um, I think I came to grips with it when, uh, when I married and my husband started making observations, you know. He said something one day that really made me angry. Somebody, we were living in Florida then, and someone came to the house and said, well, where's, where's Carolyn, you know? And he said, well, she's probably asleep. She goes to bed every night at six o'clock. And I got so angry, you know, and I thought, but then I thought about it and I, I did go to bed early, you know. When I got home from work, I would, I'd just go to bed, I'd blot everything out. Um, I developed some other habits too. I learned that alcohol, it dulled it. It didn't hurt so much, it, it felt better when I would. And so um, he came, you know, well, I don't tell that whole story about depression, but just to say that I did work my way through with, with it and uh, over a period of 20 years, I uh, had a lot of learning to do, a lot of, of um, accepting and, and, you know, cleansing to do. But um, I decided that the hatred that I felt, the unforgiveness that I felt was destroying me more than it was anyone else. And so what I did, uh, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. You know, it just stayed with me day and night. So I made, this is a simple decision I made one day. I said, I'm just gonna f be busy 24 hours a day. And by now I had two daughters and I went and bought a bike uh, where I could ride one on the back and the other one had her own bike. And we would ride and ride two or three miles a day. Mm -hmm. by, by now I was living in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And so we could ride and uh, wear ourselves out. That's really what I was doing, just wear myself out. So when I get back home, I just go like that. Then I joined the softball team. I was a tomboy from the Four Brothers. So I joined Atlanta City League, played softball during the day and would take them to the games. And by the time that I moved away from Atlanta, I had developed a rhythm and a routine of things that I really liked that allowed me to not think about that so much. Um, I, I moved five times in 10 years, but when I got back to Birmingham and discovered that uh, most of the same things that were going on when I moved, had left many years earlier, a lot of those same things were still going on. I moved into a neighborhood with my children and uh, you know, neighbors started moving out. We had a swimming pool in this neighborhood. It was a community swimming pool, but all of a sudden the pool became private. Uh, then I started hearing stories about the kids fighting on the bus and uh, I mentioned these things only to say this is sort of how I began to get active again and uh, they had built this institute. Uh, I was asked to serve on the board and I came and uh, the whole thing started. All of this uh, 25 years after the bombing of the church we got a call from USA Today. They wanted to do a 25 year interview and from that 25 year interview, that's when everything just started rolling, the ball just started all over again. I tried really hard not to go, not to accept what people were asking me to do, but when Mrs. Edelman called, I said to her, um, she had Winifred Green to call and I said, you know, I'm just somebody that survived a bombing. I can find you a really good speaker. I, I don't do that, you know, here's what I do. And so then Winifred called back and Winifred, asked, I said, I told you, I can find you a really, she said, that we know who you are, Ms. Elman said to call you, you know, and maybe because I was at the Institute is why they called. But I gave up because I didn't feel like they were going to ever accept my no, so I got up and that was the first time I went to the Haley Farm. So in terms of how all of that started, from that point on I went to Washington with Mrs. Elman uh, 
and then just started going everywhere. Wherever there was work to be done, wherever we saw that people weren't willing. And a lot of things that I had been very quiet about or genteel about, I changed somewhat because she brought out that passion in you wanting to make things better for other people. And that's still a very painful memory for me. And um, it bothers me a lot that um, not more people, I meet a lot of people on um, planes and everywhere, and, and I meet a lot of people that know nothing about this church bombing. We have people that live right here in Birmingham that have never been to the church, have never been here to the Institute. And so, you know, it just says we still have a lot of work to do. All of the work that we all do is important. Wherever you are, it's very important. And so, um, I keep carrying on, you know, the best that we can, and uh, where, wherever needs call.